Okay, so we were, um, we had, we were most of the way through my quick introduction to ADS-CFT, and I had explained how um, anti you have ADS D plus one, that's a theory of gravity, which is, um, has an asymptotically, which has an asymptotic conformal boundary, which is time-like, and um, you can put you can put whatever metric you want on that asymptotic conformal boundary. The simplest thing we can talk about is a case where uh, the conformal boundary is just R D, um, and the bulk is is ADS. I guess to be consistent here, I should really so. ADS can either be Euclidean or Lorentzian, and the boundary can either be Euclidean or Lorentzian, um, so you have to, to match them up that way. Okay, so um, I had made, started making a few comments. I have just a couple more comments about the basics of ADS-CFT, and then we're going to start talking more systematically about conformal field theory. So the next comment was that the conformal symmetries of the CFT um, on whatever space, but let's say on Minkowski space, so R D minus 1 comma 1, are the isometries of ADS D plus 1. Uh, so the most important one and, and the simplest one to think about is the example of the uh, scale transformation. So let me show you how that works. The metric, uh, remember, of the uh, anti-desitter space, if we want to pick this, uh, if we want to pick this representation where it's flat at the boundary, the metric of ADS is uh, L squared over Z squared times dz squared minus dt squared plus dx squared. The way that the scale transformation of the conformal field theory is realized in this coordinate system is by rescaling everything. Okay, so z goes to lambda z, t goes to lambda t, and x goes to lambda x. Um, obviously, the, the metric is just completely invariant. So ds squared is invariant. So this is not just a conformal symmetry of the bulk. It's a true symmetry, an isometry of the bulk metric. Um, but if we look at uh, what happens so it's, it's acting as a symmetry on the bulk, but we're going to see in a second that it's acting as a rescaling on the boundary. So to see that, um, consider a hypersurface at z equals epsilon. Uh, where epsilon is small. The induced metric on that hypersurface is uh, ds squared, uh, I'll write boundary for the, this is the metric on the conformal boundary, or on the cutoff, is uh, L squared over epsilon squared times minus dt squared plus dx squared. I've just set z equals epsilon in the metric over there. Um, and under this rescaling, um, we rescale t, we rescale x, and um, we see that um, this gets rescaled. So ds squared boundary um, gets rescaled by lambda squared. Okay, 
So the exact symmetry in the bulk is a conformal symmetry on the boundary. And the same is true for all of the other generators of the conformal group. The other thing we see from this is that um, the scale transformation in the conformal field theory corresponds to moving in the radial direction. That is, this extra emergent direction. This um, means that, roughly speaking, if, well, let me say it in words first, and then I'll write something. So, it, so rescaling this way is the, is the scale transformation where you make things bigger. Okay, so uh, roughly speaking, when you, when you make things bigger, you're going into the infrared. Okay, so, so roughly speaking, this bulk direction is uh, like infrared this way, UV that way. So like stuff that happens deep inside ADS is infrared physics from the point of view of the CFT. Stuff that happens near the boundary is UV physics from the point of view of the CFT. Now I keep giving this caveat, roughly speaking, um, because it's not quite true. So um, you know, if, I, if I scatter things deep in the bulk, but I scatter them at extremely high energies, that's a high energy process that's going to that's going to probe some some UV properties of the CFT. Um, but the more so the, the more accurate statement is just that if you have any given process, then moving it this way makes it more infrared. Moving it that way makes it more UV. Okay. So to summarize, deep in bulk is uh, sort of like a infrared and near the boundary is sort of like the UV. Can you explain why is the, those correspondences? Like, I don't think it's yeah, the yeah, so, so say we, it's, it's because move, so um, the, the scale transformation <coughs> rescaled everything, including the radial direction. Okay, so if I say, say we take lambda equals two. So we take some state in the conformal field theory, which is like a lump of stuff, a blob of stuff. Maybe we, we take some experiment where we scatter two blobs of stuff off each other, and those blobs have size one. If we do the scale transformation, then from the point of view of anti-de-sitter, we're talking about something that's happening deeper in. That's that's now maybe there's something scattering deeper into ADS. If we talk about it from the point of view of the CFT, now we're scattering blobs that are twice as big. Other questions? Next comment is that um, there's sort of two different ways of, of thinking about ADS CFT, which are called top down and bottom up. I just want to give you um, a sense of what this means. So, top down basically means that you're considering a totally well defined microscopic theory, which in almost all cases is something that came from string theory. So, for example, um, 
the sort of canonical example of, of, string, of ADS CFT and string theory is that 2B string theory on ADS5 times S5 um, is dual to n equals 4 super Yang Mills. Um, and there are various other examples of this sort where there's a specific theory of quantum gravity which in some cases is very well understood, in other cases less so. But there's some specific theory that you have in mind, which is dual to some other specific theory. And examples like this are supposed to be UV complete. The ones that we have we think are UV complete. Um, the other point of view is the bottom up, or sort of effective field theory point of view. So the bottom-up point of view is just that um, any semi-classical effective field theory in ADS uh, corresponds through the duality um, to a sector of a CFT. So it's, a, it's an effective field theory viewpoint. Um, now, often the most interesting questions are the ones that where you try to bridge the gap between the, the top-down point of view and the bottom-up point of view. Because um, what we're really interested in using ADS-CFT to do is to understand, for example, non-perturbative properties of quantum gravity. And if we really just stick to low energies, well, I don't know that we really need ADS CFT necessarily to do that. We're really interested in sort of the interplay between the UV completion and the low energy and understanding, uh, for example, whether there are constraints from the UV on the low energy or, or questions like that. Yeah, there's a question. What do you mean by sector? Um, well, I just mean that if you only talk about the effective field theory that I have in mind here, like low energy stuff. So uh, like some particles, maybe black holes. Um, but I haven't, since we're talking effective field theory here, I haven't, for example, told you the complete spectrum of strings and d-brains. So it's not supposed to be a whole theory of quantum gravity. It's just some piece of it. And roughly speaking, that's dual to a piece of CFT. And understand exactly what we mean by, by sector, that's a, that's a problem that try to solve. But just in the same sense, there has to be some piece of a CFT that's dual to the to that stuff. Um, so this but both of these are, are useful. I think it's it's essential to do to do both. This is the point of, top down is the point of view that's usually taken in, in string theory discussions. Uh, but bottom up shows up in lots of places like black hole information, black hole thermodynamics. It's also the point of view taken, for example, in, in ADS, the applications of ADS CFT to condense matter, where our goal is really to understand properties of strongly interacting matter. And while we don't know the microscopic theory of some condensed matter systems of interest, interest like, like high TC superconductivity, uh, but we know they're not 2B strings in ADS-5. Okay. <laughs> I think we know that. Um, so in that case, we're really trying to use it as an effective field theory description. And, and you don't always have to go to the UV to, to try to use it to make applications. Okay. Um, so I want to just kind of sketch how 
I mean, do this very briefly. I'm just going to give a cartoon of how ADS-CFT developed and how it was discovered. Okay, and because um, this gives us a way of, well, I think the way it was discovered is my favorite way of thinking about it. Okay, so I can I can tell you how it was discovered. Um, it's not really necessarily how it's always used now, um, but this is where it came from. And this is the idea of the near horizon limit. The last time I taught this course, actually, I, I went through in, in great detail how it was discovered, and we went through all the calculations, and you can find those in, in the, the notes that are on the website. I'm, I decided not to do that this time because I want to I want to have time for some other things. Um, so I'm going to spend like 10 minutes covering that, but you can read about it in detail in the in the notes. Um, so the the idea of a near horizon or decoupling limit um, is the following. Say we have a Reeser Nordstrom black hole in asymptotically flat space. And we go to extremality. So recall that the um, that the charge of a recent Nordstrom black hole is bounded above by the mass. Extre extremal just means that that is saturated, and as I think we talked about earlier, um, I can't remember if I drew this diagram earlier, but there's a special Penrose diagram for the uh, extremal case. Um, looks like this. Okay, so we live here. This is our infinity out here, scry plus. And uh, the horizon of the black hole is here. Uh, and the squiggly line, as usual, is the singularity. I think before we drew the non-extremal Penrose diagram, which looks a little different, um, but this is what it, this is, this is the, the structure of the extremal case. And um, the important observation is that there's an anti de Sitter space hiding in this picture. Okay. So remember, I said asymptotically flat. Okay, so out here, this geometry is just our, um, let's, let's say we're in four dimensions. So out here is just flat space. But the near horizon region of the black hole uh, is anti de Sitter. So, um, let me draw where the ADS is hiding. It's roughly speaking, it's on the horizon. So it's it's on this zigzag here. Um, but a funny thing about about this picture is that there's actually a lot of space at the zigzag. Okay, so it's better if I it's better if I fatten it out a little draw it like this. Um, okay, so if I fatten, if I fatten out the zigzag, then I get this strip. I get a sort of a wiggly strip. And we're talking about the region along there. So this region, the wiggly, the, the green region, is ADS2 times S2. I'm not going to go through that calculation now. That's probably going to be on the homework. Um, but it's similar to the calculation we did before, where, where we zoomed in on the horizon of the short-term black hole. 
there's an important difference. So when, when, we, when we look near the horizon of shore shield, um, we did an approximation. Okay, we just did a serious expansion near the horizon, and we found it was Rindler space. And this is different because this, in this case, um, you can do this exactly. So when I say there's an ADS2 times S2 there, what I mean is that you can actually take a limit of this metric um, and zoom in on the zigzag, and you find exactly ADS2 times S2. And what that means in particular is that ADS2 times S2 is a solution of the Einstein-Maxwell equations. It, it's just a piece of the original metric, and the original metric was a solution of the Einstein-Maxwell equations, so that piece is also a solution of the Einstein-Maxwell equations. So an exact solution of those equations, yeah. So we are in a four-dimensional space yeah. here, and how does the boundary have four dimensions? It should have three. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's sort of an artifact of the picture. In particular, if I go to any point, like here, and I measure the length of this, it's infinity. Okay. That calculation we could do just by writing down the metric. I'm not going to do it. Um, but actually, it's, it's really just a trick of the picture. And the horizon region itself is infinitely fat. Okay. So that's where the extra ones are. Other questions? Okay, and, and this gives uh, what I think of as sort of an outside view of ADS CFT, which is that as viewed from, think about, okay, we're this guy. Yeah. So you say it's, it's infinitely fat, but it was still, an infalling observer would go through an infinite proper time, right? Um, let's see. Um, Sounds right. Yeah. I'm confused about that. Um, because in ADS2 you can't do that? Uh, well, I'm just. When in ADS, let's see. Um, can't you do that in ADS2? Sorry? Can't you do that in ADS2? Well, in ADS2, like a null ray going through ADS2 does make it all the way through, all yeah. the way across ADS2 in, in finite affine time. Mm -hmm. So I think. It's fine. But what about a massive? A massive particle, let's see, that's true. A massive particle cannot get across ADS2. Um, ah, OK, yeah. That's it. OK, good. This, this is an important question because it has an important answer. OK, so there's an infinite amount of redshift involved between this near horizon region and infinity. OK, so that's, in fact, why it's called the decoupling limit. Okay, so everything in the near horizon region has zero energy. When you take this limit, no matter what you put here, you know, anything that's like sitting in ADS2, whatever you put there, it has zero energy as viewed from infinity because there's an infinite amount of redshift. Now, if you jump in, what that means is that if you jump in, then uh, from the point of view of that ADS2, you're a particle with infinite energy because you came from, from outside. Okay, and, a, and a, a, a person with infinite energy can make it across ADS2 because they're going to be massless. Okay, but then the person falling in won't actually see ADS2. Um, it's true that if, if you really tried to jump in um, and you weren't careful about it, like you, you jumped in from out here, then you would back react on the ADS2 because you'd be in there with a lot of energy and you'd back react on it. Um, so the way we usually think about it, well, there are, two there are two options. One is to take the decoupling limit, 
Okay, what I mean by take the decoupling limit is we zoom in on this horizon, horizon, the green region, and then we forget everything else. That's a perfectly good theory on its own. And that's what we usually mean when we talk about ADS-CFT. That, that region, that green region, is the ADS, and it's dual to a CFT. So that's one option, is to take the decoupling limit. Um, the other option, uh, which is more like what you're asking, is the outside view that I was about to explain. So um, the, idea of the, the idea here is that the observer living outside cannot distinguish uh, between two different things. So what are the two different things? Um, the first one is uh, living outside of an extremal black hole. Okay, so the, the, the person's out here, and um, we draw a little imaginary cutoff surface that divides the black hole from everything else. And then this person is allowed to do any experiments they want, but they're not allowed to jump in. Okay, so like they can, they can shoot photons at this black hole, let's see what comes out. They can, um, anything like that. They can scatter stuff off of it. They could throw in a, any, they could throw in anything and just wait and see what kind of radiation comes out. They could throw in a, a book and, and try to figure out whether they can read the book and the radiation. They could do anything. And uh, the statement of ADS-CFT is that uh, you cannot tell the difference between anything, any experiment you would do here and a second option which is that uh, you take that region and um, you make it, you just delete it. You delete that region from your space time and you put a CFT on the, on that, on the boundary where you, where, you, where you cut it out. Which of course is a lower dimensional CFT because it's missing, so it's empty in here. But there's this CFT living on the boundary. And any experiment uh, that you do um, in this black hole setup, you cannot distinguish from a, the same experiment you would do uh, with a CFT living at the boundary. Now the translation between these two can be extremely difficult and complicated. So remember, this is a strong weak duality where things that are easy on one side are often hard on the other and vice versa. Um, so uh, this is a statement in principle. That in principle, well, it's, just, it's a experimental statement that if you do an experiment, you'll see the same thing. But as far as doing calculations, is a statement that in principle, there, for any thing you calculate over here, there should be something you, you can in principle calculate over here. Um, but mapping what's going on here to what's going on there uh, can be a really hard problem. Okay. Um, maybe I can give an example that kind of highlights the, the relationship between scale and, and depth. Okay, so um, say you just so Say you just throw something in. I don't know, you take, a, you take a cup of tea. There's my cup of tea. And you just drop it into the black hole. So what's going to happen is the, the black hole is going to get a little bigger. It's going to heat up a little bit. Um, and your, your tea is very quickly going to be gone. It's going to just... Um, merge into the black hole and quickly settle down to something that's almost spherically symmetric. Yeah? Well, very quickly from the perspective of the T, but from your perspective it takes some time. Well, it's exponentially close to settle down very quickly. It's true that, it's true that um, you never see something cross an event horizon, um, but remember that we have to stay outside this cutoff surface. Okay. 
And if we, if we, from the point of view of what's happening outside that cutoff surface, um, this is very quickly just settled down to a slightly hotter black hole. Now, we have to be a little careful with this experiment because of what I was explaining before, the infinite blue shift and everything. So I want to I want to drop in a cup of tea, um, adiab like adiabatically. I'll put a rocket booster on this cup of tea, and make sure that it goes in very slowly in such a way that we only add a finite amount of near horizon energy to this black hole. Okay, so what does that correspond to in the CFT? Um, in the CFT, this this you drop in the cup of tea. Everything is the same until it gets to the cutoff surface. Uh, but the CFT interact, the, the T interacts with the CFT. In fact, the, the same, there, there are couplings in, in the theory that couple the, the matter in this cup to the operators of the CFT. And when the cup hits the CFT, it just creates a bunch of CFT junk. Okay, CFTs are not, don't, they're not really made of particles, they're made of like particle soup. Okay, so your tea makes a bunch of particle soup, which spreads out on this sphere. And um, uh, after, after a short amount of time, you just have some hot particle soup uh, spread out on the sphere. So that's the CFT description of what's happening. Um, questions? Yeah. What if you didn't do it slowly and just dropped it in normally? Well, that's the same as this infinite blue shift thing. I think if you just drop something in, then um, you're gonna you're gonna do something drastic to the. It's it's gonna hit here with a huge amount of energy. It's gonna have a large back reaction, and then you can't use ADS-CFT. I mean, it's allowed to have a little bit of energy. There's a. It just has to be. It just has to be a very small amount of energy, and then you'll be able to describe it from the CFT point of view. But when we say that the, the mass of the black hole is M, that's like as viewed from far away. And so yeah. if you put something in with mass DM, even if you just like throw it in normally, that should like just the end state just be like another black hole again with like mass M. Plus yeah, but the, ex the, near the non extremal black hole looks very different from the extremal black hole. So it's, it's a big difference if you if you drop in a finite amount of energy. You really have to drop in an infinitesimal amount. Yeah. yeah I can see the ADS on that diagram. Where's the CFT? On on this diagram? Yeah. Good. The CFT lives at the boundary of ADS, which on this diagram is the outer part of the green strip. So. It lives on this, that's where the CFT is. And the, that dashed line is the same as this dashed line. Okay, so the, the, this imaginary cutoff where you, where you separate inside the black hole, inside the near region from outside the, the far, outside the near region, that's the ADS boundary. That's where we sort of glue things together. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there then a, an explicit breaking of conformal symmetry in the UV depending on where, <clears throat> where you choose to put this boundary? If you really take the outside view, then yes. Okay, so the outside view is, is not quite in the decoupling limit. Um, and so it's not quite a conformal field theory. There's some, it, it stops being a conformal field theory in the UV. It sort of looks like a conformal field theory until you get to here, and then it turns into something else. Um, so yes, in this point of view, it's not exactly decoupled, so it's not exactly a CFT. Uh, but when we take the decoupling limit, all that gets sent up to infinite energy. Um, so then it's a true CFT without any breaking in the UV. Which is the limit where this band shrinks to zero. Correct. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Does this, I mean, you said that this duality is just about what the outside observer can and cannot distinguish. but. Could someone jumping in distinguish them? I don't know. Um, could someone jumping in distinguish them? I, I'm not. Sh I don't know. This is a tricky question. Um, I mean, I think the answer is no, but um, I'm not sure what it feels like to be a CFT. <laughs> uh, 
I, I think that, I think I think I think the answer, a more careful answer, is that um, it's a duality. You can't distinguish them. Okay, so so the answer is no, um, but it relies on having some very special couplings between the matter that you're made of and the matter that the CFT that, that exists in the CFT. And it's those very special couplings which allow you to sort of survive when you, when you crash into that wall. So I don't recommend crashing into any old wall of CFT, but if you, if you happen to know it's dual to this situation, then you might be okay. Well, I don't really recommend jumping into the black hole either, <laughs> but you, know, you might be better off that way, yeah. Yeah. You talked about the CFT deforming to something else as you leave the near horizon region. Yeah. What are the le what are those like the leading order terms that that deviation look like? The leading order so the, the that deviation um, would correspond to adding some irrelevant operators to the CFT. So irrelevant operators become important in the UV and they break conformal invariance. And they require a UV, so irrelevant operators require some UV completion. So adding those irrelevant operators corresponds to coupling it to, to flat space. And um, you could ask whether you can, like, you know, add those UV irrelevant operators and then RG flow all the way up into the UV and see if you can get all the way out of the near horizon region. Um, nobody has managed to do that. It's not obviously impossible. But nobody has managed to do it. The only way to, to do it is to go back and start talking about the gravitational description. Yeah. So when you first described the duality and or the, the holographic principle, let's say, you explained that the degrees of freedom of a black hole can be thought of as encoded in the surface or something like that. Yeah. But in this case and all the cases we have seen, it's either the black hole or the surface. But it's not like the black hole has degrees of freedom in its surface, but it's equivalent to something else without the black hole with degrees of freedom without the Yeah, I think that's the better way of saying it. Okay. When, when people say they're encoded in the surface, that's a bit loose. I think the better way of saying it is that, um, is that you can think of them as being, <laughs> as living on, you can think of them as living on the surface. And in the context of, well, in the general case, we don't really know what that means. Like, what does it mean to think of the degrees of freedom as living on the surface? But in ADS CFT, we know exactly what it means. It means that you can, you can literally put a CFT there instead. Yeah. Is there any understanding of black holes where you can just eliminate black holes from our theories and put boundaries of CFT there? Like, uh, yeah, uh, you mean, sorry, that's what this is, right? Yeah. Or you mean in, in general? general? Like not in this specific case, just in Schwarz, for example? Um, well, that's where I want to go later in this course. The answer is no. We don't have a general understanding of that. Okay. But um, recently, we have, a, we have a way of sort of making it look kind of like this and have some progress on that. And that's kind of where we're headed in a few weeks. Right. OK, any other questions? Yeah. Actually, we should release the left hand side, right? Because um, the strong weak duality, the graph is weak on the CFT side. We don't trust this well, Jeremy. Wait, sorry, Wait, which one are you pointing at? Uh, you said that the CFT is on the boundary of the, the, the blue dots. Yeah, oh, here you mean? Yeah, but yeah. in that case, you actually don't trust the geometric description. Well, out there, it's perfectly good. Yeah, so sorry, I'm actually, I... I should think of uh, another geometry that deletes everything on the left. I don't, I'm not sure I understand. It's strong, so the fact that it's a strong weak duality just means it's really hard to, that we do trust this. This, this geometry is, is, is totally good and it's well described by weakly coupled gravity. The fact that it's strong weak just means it's really hard to calculate anything in the CFT. Or at least that you have to, you can't use like ordinary Feynman diagrams. That's, that's, that's all it means. It's this, there really is a geometry here. It's described by a strongly coupled CFT. Yes. Yeah. When you're actually when you're calculating for the CFT, how do you choose the 
boundary surface or around the black hole with this DNA Um. Well, good. Okay. Let me draw this picture I had at the beginning again. This was the z equals zero slice, and, and then z goes this way. Okay, so that dashed line, from the point of view of, of the, Z, the ZDS, um, well, I should do ADS2 for this example, but in general, ADS D plus one. So that dashed line is like here. And um, it's not, see, we're not fully in the decoupling limit. So we don't keep all of ADS. What we keep is, is this side. We keep all the stuff over here. But when we get to that dashed line, it opens up into flat space instead of being ADS anymore. And so as you point out, there's this ambiguity in exactly where we put this dashed line. Uh, we, could, we could move it, we could give it some wiggles, or we could move it in a little further, or whatever. And those will correspond to the um, things you can do here. For example, if you decide to put that in a little further, that corresponds in CFT to doing the scale transformation. If you decide to put some wiggles on it like this, that corresponds to doing the CFT in a non-flat metric. Because now the induced metric on this cutoff surface will not be flat. So all that has some, has some corresponding statement in CFT. Yeah. So in this case, you already started with an extremal black hole, and then you're zooming into the uh, near horizon base. Yeah. So I could I could think about a different situation where you don't impose extremality at the start, but rather approach extremality and near horizon in some way. Yeah. Like, uh, would that give the same result, or those limits don't come in? Um, th those, they, they don't commute. So, um, well, there there are two limits that you could do the commute. So um, let me say the two things you can do. One thing you can do is take the decoupling limit. Now you have ADS. Well, you can put a black hole in ADS. OK. You're still in the decoupling limit. But you could put a black hole in ADS. And that's like the situation where we threw in the cup of tea. We still have the decoupling limit, but we put a black hole in there. And um, another way of, of describing that is exactly what you just said, is that instead of taking the extremal limit and then the near horizon limit, you sort of take them together in a, in a, way, in a carefully balanced way so that you end up with a black hole in the near horizon region. Yeah, it's always, it's always a little confusing. Black holes show up twice when we do ADS-CFT. The extremal black hole shows up when we talk about where it came from and everything. But the extremal black hole is, um, it, it gives you anti-de-sitter space in vacuum. It gives, you vac it gives you empty anti de sitter space. And it corresponds to the CFT vacuum state under the duality. But then, Black holes show up again in ADS-CFT when we put a black hole in ADS. That corresponds to taking this extremal black hole and heating it up infinitesimally above extremality. We have to heat it up so little that you don't notice it from infinity. So it's still actually an extremal black hole, but uh, the, it works into the order of limits in a way that you end up with a black hole in the near region. Uh, the other comment that I was going to make is that you can put, um, this was a case of <clears throat> the four-dimensional Schwarzschild black hole, uh, but you can consider higher dimensional black holes, including black brains. So a black brain is like a black hole, but the horizon is, has some extended directions. It's not just a sphere. And uh, using black brains, you can get ABS can get higher dimensional ADSs. Um, so that's where the higher dimensional versions of, of ADS CFT come from. They come
come from zooming in on black brains in higher dimensions. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Question is, um, when we talk about the usual AS5, uh, time S5 and the square on news, do you either have black hole or have the brain? Um, yeah. Why, like, uh, to confuse why in this, uh, when you talk about CFT, that space time is still there. I thought. So, which, when you talk about CFT, you delete everything to the left of the CFT. Yeah. Did I say, answer your question? Yeah, so I should think of it as a different space time. Well, I'm not sure what you mean by different. You either have the whole space time that I drew, or you delete everything to the left of the dashed line and put some degrees of freedom on the dashed line. Those are the two options. Did I just switch the board twice? I think I did. <laughs> We talked about the conformal group, CFTs have come up a few times. I'm now going to spend some time talking systematically about conformal field theory. Not too systematically, we don't have a ton of time to, to, to cover the subject, but I want to cover uh, some of the basics and I want to cover uh, enough that we can do some calculations for evaporating black holes over the next few weeks. Okay, so. Um, I'll have some references on the website, um, but we're just going to go through, we're going to start with some of the basics. So first of all, some basic terminology. Um, we're going to talk about three closely related things, and I want to distinguish between them carefully to avoid some common confusions. Okay, so there's scale invariance, there's conformal invariance. And there's vial invariance. And these are closely related, but these are all different things. So scale invariance um, is a symmetry under x goes to lambda x. Um, it simply means that the theory has no intrinsic length scale. And um, when I say it's a symmetry, I mean it's a symmetry in the, in the usual sense that we mean it in quantum mechanics, which is that symmetries act on a fixed theory. They act on the Hilbert space of a fixed theory. They organize the states in the Hilbert space of a fixed theory. Um, let me write something. Okay, that's also going to be true for conformal invariance, so I'll write that here. These are symmetries. They act on the Hilbert space. Um, so they leave the theory fixed, they act on the Hilbert space, and they take one state to another state. It's not that the theory doesn't notice if you do a scale transformation. Like there's, it's, it's not that there's no difference between like a ball, a blob of conformal matter this big and a blob of conformal matter this big. There's a difference. It's two different states. But if you tell me all the observables in, in the, of the big blob, I can tell you all the observables of the, big, of the little blob by doing a symmetry transformation. OK, conformal invariance. Uh, we, talked about the, we talked about the conformal group. Um, and remember what it was, it was the diffeomorphisms x to x prime uh, such that the metric just changes by an overall factor.
It's crucial, though, that this defines what we mean by conformal transformations. But when we actually do conformal transformations, we do not change the metric. It's like, it's like if, we did the, if we did the diffeomorphism, <laughs> it would change the metric like this. But then when we actually apply the symmetry, we don't change the metric. It, lives in a fixed, it, it stays in a fixed metric. Okay, vial invariance is um, an invariance, or really all these things are covariances under uh, a rescaling, an overall rescaling of the metric, but not necessarily a diff. When we do a vial transformation, we do change the metric. Okay, so this is a totally different thing, but it's very similar. They're closely related. We're going to see how to get from one to the other. Um, but you have to think about it differently. Okay, so um, in a vial transformation, we actually change the metric. Um, and that means it's not a symmetry. In, it's often called vial symmetry. It's not really a symmetry in the usual sense, because it doesn't act on a fixed theory. Uh, this acts on background fields. Uh, and it therefore changes the theory. It's a, it's, a, it's a different quantum field theory that you're talking about because it's in a different background. It doesn't take you from one state in a given Hilbert space to another state in that Hilbert space. OK. so. Why are we talking about all of these things together? Well, it's mostly true um, that scale invariance gives you the others for free. Okay, so it's, it's mostly true that if you have scale invariance, then this gives you conformal invariance um, and that this gives you also vial invariance. Um, well, I guess I should say up to anomalies. And we'll talk about those anomalies. Um, so, why is this mostly true? This is, this is really very surprising. The conformal invariance is a much bigger symmetry than scale invariance. Um, so this is very surprising. Uh, at a physics level, I think the reason for this is, is basically locality. Okay. Because what is a conformal transformation? It's a local scale transformation. And we're going to turn this into equations in a minute. But roughly speaking, the idea is that the only way to be scale invariant is to be locally scale invariant. And if you're locally scale invariant, because they don't, that, it has to be that way, because it's a local theory. The only way to be locally, once you're locally scale invariant, well, then you're conformally invariant. Vial invariance we'll, we'll also talk about. Um, so. um, okay, I'll, I'll make a deep, more, I'll, I'll understand, I'll explain what I mean by, by mostly a little bit uh, pretty soon. Okay, the other general comment I want to make um, is that CFT uh, People like to think of CFTs as the building blocks for QFTs, for, for quantum field theories. That is, all, all quantum field theories. And the, um, the reason for that is that almost any quantum field theory, 
that's well defined at all energy scales uh, is defined as an interpolation between two CFTs. So people draw this picture. Uh, QFT is CFT in the UV, and our G flow is CFT in the IR. So why is that? Well, QFTs flow under the renormalization group, and the fixed points of the renormalization group are the scale invariant theories. Okay, so if you flow forever, you're going to reach a scale invariant theory, or, you're, or it's going to stop making sense. So that's why I started with the caveat that this is a statement about QFTs that are well-defined at all energy scales. Okay, so if, if you scale all the way into the UV or all the way into the IR, you're going to get something scale invariant. And we just said that almost every scale invariant theory uh, is conformally invariant. So that's where this picture comes from. The caveat is that this paradigm, um, it misses physically interesting and important theories. Okay? So uh, for example, QED in four dimensions does not fit into this, does not fit into this picture. Uh, because QED in four dimensions has a Landau pole, if you try to go up into the UV, uh, it doesn't, it, it stops making sense eventually, so there's not a conformal fixed point up there. Um, so there are, there, are other, and there are other examples like that which are physically interesting and we care about, which we don't really know how to put into, the, into this picture. But, um, yeah. Questions? Yeah. Peter. What about QCD? QCD is good because QCD is um, also has a Landau pole. QCD. Oh, you mean Q, real QCD or wait? So QCD <laughs> is asymptotically free. So what? So no, I mean in the infrared. Oh, you're calling that the land? Okay. Um, Okay, so, so QCD is, is asymptotically free in the UV. So up here we have a, a free theory. We're good up there. Uh, in the infrared, QCD is gapped. And so this theory is just the nothing theory. Um, so in that case, it's free up here and nothing down here. Yeah? How oh, is that notation somewhat strange? Like diff means d squared plus d squared. You really mean g prime equal to omega squared g. Here? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, well, I, I, yeah, I agree it would probably be better to write it that way. Um, it depends what we mean by arrow. I mean, I just mean like, okay, if you have a flat metric and we do a rescaling on it, you apply this arrow, x goes to lambda x, then this would become lambda squared dx squared, therefore x to lambda x is a conformal transformation. Uh, this arrow is not a diff, this arrow is like this operation. But in that case, the distances between points are not actually changing, right? But in the while case, the distances between points are actually changing. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna come. I'm gonna come back to that and say it carefully. But yes, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. So usually we say that if a theory has mass, it's not conformally invariant. Yeah. But let's say you have like a scalar field with mass coupled to gr. And the theory is DPO invariant. And the square root is symmetric, and everything is diffeomorphism invariant. Uh -huh. Conformal invariance is a subset of diffeomorphisms, so that theory could be conformal invariant. So there's something else that we mean when we say conformal invariant, which is DPO plus something else. Yeah, this, this discussion applies to quantum field theories, it doesn't apply to, to theories coupled to gravity. Um, the diffeomorphism invariance that holds when you couple to gravity is sort of a trivial one. It's it's a it's it's more like a gauge it's more like a gauge symmetry. It doesn't take states to states. Um, 
I suppose we could probably. Yeah, I, I don't know what it would mean to, to say a theory of gravity coupled to matter is good. I don't even know what that would mean, really, to say that it's conformally invariant. Um, we could talk about the matter sector being conformally invariant, but. Um, We don't usually talk about that for the. I, I, I'm just rest. like a classical field in curved space time is diffeo invariant, and conformal transformations are diffeo. That's all No, the conform no conformal transformations are not diffeo. Okay, oh. so that so okay. that's important. They're not conformal transformations. Look kind of like diffs that do a vial. But they are neither diffios nor, nor vials. Okay, so diffs are just relabelings, and they don't do anything. Like, they just relabel stuff. Uh, a conformal transformation actually takes you from one state to a different state. So the, conform it's, the confusion is that the conformal group, which is how we came up with a set of generators and everything, is defined by talking about diffeomorphisms. But the actual conformal transformations that we do are not diffeomorphisms. One way to think about them, and I'll come back to this, but let me just say it now because it sort of answers your question, is that they're, com they're a combination of vial and diff that uh, does a physical transformation, well, fi that, fixed, that keep, does a physical transformation in a fixed theory. I don't completely understand why you say that QVD can't be put into this paradigm. It's uh, uh, it's because like if it has it has a Landau pole, so it cannot. It's I mean the description breaks down much before you go into the very high energy scales. So uh, isn't that true for an, like any effective field theory? Well, this this paradigm is not true for effective field theories. It's true for quantum field theories that are well defined at all energy scales. Yeah, QVD is not well defined at all. Right, right. No, that's all I was saying, is that it's not, it's not an RG, QFT, so QED is not an RG flow from between two CFTs. That's all I meant. Yeah, because it's an effective field theory. Yes. Okay. Yeah, right. is we don't really know if, 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 say, the standard model has to be UV completed by a CFT. It might be that, that you get up to the scale of quantum gravity and then you UV complete it with quantum gravity. So it's not necessarily true that the standard model is, is living on an RG flow between uh, non-gravitational CFTs. Give a few examples. Um, so let me start with just some theories that are classically scale invariant and make a few comments about them. Uh, these are easy to find. This is just anything that you can write down without any dimensionful parameters. So here's one, the free theory. This is obviously scale invariant. I didn't write down any dimensionful parameters. And um, in fact, this is a conformal field theory. OK, that one was easy. Um, the less trivial one is massless QED in four dimensions. So we could write down the Lagrangian, but maybe it's easier just to say that the fine structure constant is 1 over 137, and there's no units. 
Okay, so um, this theory is classically scale invariant. Um, so there's no scale classically. Uh, but the beta function is not zero. So um, you know that this theory is actually quantum mechanically not scale invariant. And uh, when we say that the fine structure constant is 1 over 137, we really mean at very long distances. In fact, this fine structure constant at 90 GV uh, is, I feel like blasphemous writing this on the board, but the fine <laughs> structure constant is 1 over 127. 127. Okay, so I had to introduce units to tell you that, so this theory is not scale invariant as a quantum field theory. Um, here's another one. So let's look at uh, in four dimensions the theory with a 5 fourth column. Um, so we can do some dimensional analysis and conclude that, that G is classically dimensionless um, because, let's see, so the whole thing has to be dimensionless, which means that uh, we get two, two energies from here, so phi has dimension one, so this operator has dimension four, and um, that's just the right amount cancel the measure, so G is dimensionless. Uh, the beta function is not zero, so this is not a CFT. Uh, but if we just look classically, then we can learn how to do conformal transformations. So let's see what a conformal transformation, or rather a scale transformation looks like in this theory. Uh, so the equation of motion is d squared phi is equal to g phi cubed. I'm dropping some factors. And given a solution to this equation, phi 1 of x, um, we can find another solution. And you could easily uh, do the scale transformation or dimensional analysis and check this, that uh, phi 2 of x given by lambda to the delta phi 1 of lambda x, where delta equals 1 is the dimension of the operator phi. Uh, and you can easily check that this is also a solution of the equation of motion in this theory. So Scale transformation x goes to x prime. Uh, we learn that phi of x goes to phi prime of x prime, given by lambda to the minus delta phi of x. Yeah. So, how do I say? So you're combining the scale transformation, which is a DPL, plus the while transformation, which retains operators by their dimensions? Well, yes, but you're thinking too much for this example. I mean, the <coughs> that's why I wanted, we'll come back and talk about how it's a combination of those two things. But for now, I'm just saying you take this and you plug it into this equation, and it's still true. Yeah, so, yeah but so that's not how scalar fields Transform under change coordinates. So you're doing something. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Right, because there's a lamp in it. Yeah. Um, 
Um, okay, I just went through that because if you because now when I start talking about CFTs, I'm going to pull this out and um, just want to point out that all the primes, where all the primes go and everything gets confusing, but like it's just the same as, as looking at a, a classical wave equation. Um, okay, so those were just some examples that were mostly not CFTs. I'll mention a few actual CFTs. Um, in addition to the free theories, there are uh, two-dimensional sigma models. So a sigma model uh, looks like a bunch of scalar fields in two dimensions uh, with a funny kinetic term. This is not necessarily a, this is not necessarily conformal, but you can calculate the beta function in this theory, and the beta function uh, turns out to be the um, curvature the turns out to be the Einstein equation for this metric. So this is conformal if and only if uh, this gij here uh, is a solution of the Einstein equation. That's sort of the starting point for how string theory gives gravity. Uh, another example is four-dimensional n equals four super young mills. I believe it was unknown for a long time whether there were interacting conformal field theories in four dimensions. Um, but here's one. So this is sort of everyone's favorite uh, super conformal field theory. It has a whole bunch of supersymmetry in addition to conformal symmetry. Everyone's other favorite CFT in more than two dimensions, I guess I should say, is uh, this one. So integral in three dimensions, d phi squared plus m squared phi squared plus d phi four. Now, that doesn't look like a CFT. It's got Two, dimension, two dimensionful parameters in it, and in fact, it's not a CFT. Uh, but one of the great things about beta functions is that they not only mess up your CF, they not only mess up conformal invariance, they give you a new way to get conformal invariance. And what happens here is that this theory is conformal in the infrared. Uh, so it appears to have these massive. So these, these dimensionful couplings in it. But uh, when you go into the infrared, if you tune the couplings, you can reach a, a, a conformal fixed point. And uh, it's very likely uh, to lie in the same universality class as the critical Ising model. OK, so this we think of as the Ising CFT. Note that this Lagrangian is is not a well at least not naively a very useful way of studying the critical Ising model because uh, we have to do this flow in the infrared and it becomes strongly interacting. So often the best ways of studying CFTs don't even refer back to this Lagrangian. Now in this case you can actually do some very clever tricks and get pretty far with the Lagrangian. Uh, but that's not always the case. There are some CFTs where you literally can't even write the Lagrangian down, but you can still say a lot about them. Yeah. Is this related to a spin icing model? Uh, uh, spin icing model? You mean like the regular? You mean like the actual? What, yeah. By spin icing model? You mean like? I just mean you said this is you're calling this the critical icing model. I wonder whether. It's yes, the this is this is the theory of the critical point of the actual icing model. The, so what you're calling the spin icing model, I think I, you just I, mean I, the I, icing model. I just mean icing model with spins. Yes. This is the theory of the critical point uh, of the lattice spin model that you have in mind. Well, it's 
it, it's in the same universality class and, and in, so it describes in, the... In two dimensions, I guess? Two spatial dimensions? Uh, in three dimensions. So well, you, you've got a time dimension in there, so I mean, like, would your spins be arranged in like a 2D? Yeah, so, so as, as far as the Isi model, um, the statement is that if you take this CFT viewed as a Euclidean CFT, that's the theory of the classical um, space dimension three Isaac model. So spins on a on a three in a three dimensional lattice uh, would correspond to the to the Euclidean conformal field theory. Uh, you can also talk about the um, quantum Ising model, and this is the critical point of the two plus one dimensional quantum Ising model. Oh, we're out of time. I'll mention the last one because it's the last one on the list, which are called the 2D minimal models. Um, so the 2D minimal models are uh, a series of exactly solvable models in two dimensions that include, for example, the 2D Ising model, um, and were famously uh, solved uh, back in the 80s um, using bootstrap methods that have sort of evolved into, into a, whole, a whole new slew of methods that we have today. All right, let's stop here.